Should we start or how are we doing? One moment. It's okay. We'll be because ready. I just see the, yeah, I see the live thing. Okay. We, are, we are now live. It's streaming over so you can get started. Okay. Thank you. Welcome everybody um, to AFO Cafe. These are informal science conversations about all things nature, I should say, because today we're going to um, hear a talk that's not on birds. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Valentina Ferretti and I'm the president of Association of Field Ornithologists. And let me just introduce AFO um, to all of those that don't know our organization. We are a member-based organization um, with a focus on the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. And we uh, view ourselves as being the bridge between professional and amateur ornithologists. We have a strong focus in Latin America and we achieve this um, through outreach, scientific meetings and grant programs. Uh, this year is our 100 year anniversary and we're planning an ex exciting meeting actually in Plymouth, Massachusetts in um, October on the 10th to the 13th. And we are all welcome to join. It's going to be a scientific meetings. We have amazing field trips um, to see some shorebirds and pelagic birds as well. And uh, the area is just amazing. So you should, um, Put that on your schedule. Our next AFO Cafe is going to be on March 25th, and it's going to be uh, presented by Scott Taylor, Sean Billerman, and Robert Curry. And they're going to be talking about avian hybridization and the insights into avian ecology and evolution. Our cafes are sponsored by Avinet Research Supplies. And Avinet Research Supplies is owned actually by the Association of Field Ornithologists. And the mission of the ARS business is to provide bird and bat researchers with the highest quality research equipment and supplies uh, while ensuring also their legal and ethical use. Our goal is to effectively serve the research community and to aid in conservation efforts that align with the mission of Association of Field Ornithologists. So if you need to buy research equipment, nest nets, um, books, binoculars, you can visit us at avinet.com and you can um, see all the products that we offer there. If you enjoy our AFO Cafe, and you're still not a member of AFO, you can actually become a member and uh, you should visit our website at afonet.org. And let me introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, today, we're going to hear Dr. Emily Choi and Kendra Tingmyak. Uh, they're going to be talking about Arctic marine predators as sentinels of environmental change in marine e ecosystems. And Dr. Um, Emily Choi is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences at McGill University and Environment in, and Climate Change Canada. Her research is supported by an NSERC and a L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Research Excellence Fellowships. Uh, Dr. Choi is studying the physiological response of thick built mirrors to climate change on Coates Island, Nunavut. She completed her PhD in biological sciences at the University of Manitoba on beluga whales as sentinels of environmental change in the Beaufort Sea ecosystem in partnership with the Inuvialuit communities. Dr. Choi was a scientist on the Victoria Strait expedition and a recipient of the Erebus Medal. She's an explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, a scientific advisor for the Western Family Foundation, Foundation and a council member, actually, of Association of Field Ornithologists. And Kendra uh, Tingmyak is a beneficiary of the Inuvialuit final agreement. In um, 2012, Kendra graduated with honors from the Aurora College Environmental and Natural Resources Technology Program 
in her hometown, hometown of Inuvik, Northwest Territory. Kendra currently resides uh, 3,700 kilometers away from home to pursue the University of Lethbridge Indigenous Governance and Business Management undergraduate degree. Initially, Kendra was enrolled as a post-diploma environmental science undergraduate. However, she switched her academic path to develop the foundation of her future career aspirations of becoming an independent consultant. Kendra's former career was situated within the Inuvialuit Regional Corporations Innovation, Science and Climate Change Division, referred to as the Inuit Research Advisor for the Inuvialuit Settlement Region. Kendra maintained the liaison between the Western research ideologies and the traditional Inuvialuit worldviews. Most importantly, Kendra advocated for the transfer of knowledge between regional Inuvialuit leadership, elders, youth, academia, and researchers. And with that, we welcome Emily and Kendra. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And you can uh, start. Good afternoon, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I will be starting our presentation. Um, we do have a question and answer period at the end. So if um, you have any questions for me, um, feel free to ask them while I'm presenting, but also keep them for afterwards as well. So with that, I will start sharing my screen. I will also go back, make sure you can see my video. Can everybody still see, see and hear me? Great. All right, so I am here to talk to you all about collaborative beluga research in the Inuvialuit Settlement Region. I prepared this presentation for the Association of Ornithologists for today, February 25th. Kendra, we lost your mic. We can't hear you, Kendra. And most importantly, um, it would it would benefit your yourself and your research and the communities that you're working with um, if if you go up with these types of questions in mind. Um, so, what are the various community dy dynamics? Um, there are six communities within the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, so it would be um, very helpful to know what. Kendra, we cannot hear you. Our communities are um, registered as both Dene and Inuvialuit communities, so it's important to know what, what's the community dynamics that you're going up to work with. Um, and then you ask yourself, who do you communicate with, right? So who are the important players or the people that you need to be involved with before you even get up there? Um, so what is a concern that the communities would like an answer to? Um, that, that will definitely be um, a highlight going up to a community and asking them what they would like to research you know it, it kind of gives the community the perspective that that you're going up there mindful of their situation and also their concerns and then wanting to
there's uh, there are various levels of leadership. We do have youth. We have elder elders committees. We have um, hunters and trappers committees. And like I mentioned earlier, we are uh, multicultural. So there are often times um, a regional resource board for one for one First Nation band, and then there might be another one for the Inuvialuit. So it's it's important to know who you can partner with and how, and then what the benefits are of these partners. Partnerships. Um, I am, um, I'm, a, I guess, a poster child of of a benefit beneficial partnership. Um, I started out very young. I wanted I wanted to know what was happening in in my backyard, you know. So I grew up kind of in Kendall Island every single summer, and um, and I got myself involved uh, with Lisa Lacetto, Dr. Lisa Lacetto, and her work, and that's how I met Dr. Emily Choi. Um, so. It's important to know that partnerships are beneficial not just for yourself or the, for the community, but, but for the uh, youth as well. So moving on, um, this is a photo of Kendall Island. So um, Valentina had mentioned that I graduated from the Environment and Natural Resources Technology Program. So in September... and just literally two months later. Uh, so in September of 2011, we spent two weeks out there and, and we did a lot of water sampling. Um, and, and so Don, Donald Ross took some really amazing photos and here's one of them. And it is our Inuvialuit flag right there with the, the gyre falcon and, and uh, our parking lot of boats. So what are the various community dynamics and who should you make contact with? So like I mentioned, there are six communities within the Inuvialuit sediment region, um, Aklavik, Inuvik, Polituk, Saks Harbor, Taktoyaktuk, and Ulukaktuk. Um, there are three cultures. So we've got Inuvialuit, Dene, and Métis cultures intertwined within our community. Regional Youth Advisory Group. Um, we also incorporate the Hamlet municipalities and um, co-management boards. Um, and this photo here is courtesy of our Immobile Living History Project. Uh, if you'd like more information on that, you can totally just Google Immobile Living History um, and find some really good information on, on the background of the Immobile Settlement Region. So coming up to the Immobile Settlement Region, um, we, we pride ourselves on meaningful and productive research. Um, and to do so, you would initiate contact with community leadership to identify their priorities. And, and this is, is just to showcase to the community that you're up there um, for them. You know, it's, it's, it's an all-around beneficial um, relationship that you're going up there to build. You can determine what types of research has already been done which organizations have overlapping concerns, and what types of resources are currently available. Up there, what's already been done. Um, you don't want to quote unquote waste your time and effort up there. So, or to be turned away, you know, that's, that's I think one of the biggest fears is for researchers to go up to the, to wherever they want to research and say, this is what I want to do. And then the community being like, yeah. Like a 
foundations with that will ensure time and energy invested will be most beneficial for Um, it was it was so great to get up there. So I kind of spent you know the entire spring to fall um, understanding the Bulgo well, or like getting a better understanding because it is a it is a source of of, of substance substance for my family. So that's why I was um, particularly interested in the Bulgo and and wanted to know what types of research was necessary. just want to know what's going on right so and and if they can help and they know they kind of know what they're talking about so it's important to it was important to me to to build that to seek that relationship and then build it further Lastly, I just wanted to finish off with beneficial partnerships. So these partnerships transfer knowledge. Um, Um, she, she introduces me to a lot of wonderful opportunities, like this one, for example. Um, we meet up at conferences that, that we both, um, because of our field of work, we both end up at the same conferences. So we meet up and we spend time together. So I really appreciate the long-lasting friendships that I built from these partnerships. Um, but also brought in our viewpoints, right? So um, I... I wasn't certain about certain things um, about my land and my water, so I, I, I've been able to gain a better understanding. But also, it broadens the researchers' viewpoints. You know, like how how much traditional knowledge is valuable, right? So we preserve those traditions by documenting, by documenting everything that's going on and that what's happening, how our communications developed. Um, so we're pre preserving those traditions. Um, we develop long-term monitoring programs. So um, these types of partnerships um, last and I like the um, evolve, you know, so they go on over time. You might be interested in, in one part of the blogger and then over time you might end up researching the entire the entire animal so or the entire mammal sorry so you end up developing long term monitoring programs. You also determine priority areas. So the health the health and wellness of the beluga habitat, right? And and what's happening there. Um, and then communicating those results back to the communities, you know, letting them know that um, the health of your beluga is fine um, and, and we're going to continue to monitor and if there's any questions or concerns that you might have down the line, then please bring them forward and we'll work on them together. Um, and then it also incorporates others in use in all aspects of the research activities. So luckily for me, I, I was able to bring my son and he was really young at the time. Um, so he was about eight years old and and I had never you know, been away from him for, for very long. So he was able to come with me out, out there on our, on our radio trip and, and spend um, the entire summer with me out there. So I never had to worry about him, but he was also involved, you know. He, he would 
um, ask questions about the Beluga, um, and if there's conferences that I was going to, so like the Beluga Summit, for example, he came with me, you know, and he sat on a panel and he got pictures taken. So it really is important, um, these partnerships are, are, are um, for everybody. Um, so I, I really uh, wanted to thank Emily and, and the research community for incorporating um, everybody. Um, and with that, I am done. So thank you for listening. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your questions. So what I think what we are going to do now if we can is uh, go to Emily's presentation and then at the end we'll have uh, the questions and answers and uh, we can talk a little bit more. I think Kendra, uh, your internet was very poor and so at times we couldn't hear you. So <laughs> I'm sure um, that uh, people will have some um, questions. Okay, yeah. I. I had noticed that earlier, and I was going to strengthen my phone, but then we started, and I completely forgot. So um, I'm sorry about that. And yes, if there's any questions, please reach out. So Emily, you can yeah, you can start. Okay, thank you. Just share my screen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, for my talk, I will be uh, talking about a bit about my uh, specific PhD work, which uh, was part of the community-based monitoring program that uh, Kendra discussed. And I would just like to say that although I'm sharing my results from my PhD, it was part of a larger collaborative project with partners across Northern communities, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and several universities who all helped to make my research possible. And if you're interested in community-based monitoring program, um, there's several amazing ones across the Canadian North. The great one featuring birds is the Arctic Eider Society. And so I encourage you to, um, to, uh, to uh, take a look at some of, the, of that group. So Arctic Eider Society. Now there's several characteristics that make beluga whales an ideal sentinel species for monitoring Arctic marine change. They're the most abundant Arctic odontocete with a circumpolar distribution. So they're found across the Arctic. Uh, they're highly specialized for Arctic environments. Uh, for example, they lack a dorsal fin, uh, which helps them to navigate under sea ice. They also have thick layers of blubber. They're long lived with a low reproductive rate. Um, there are whales that we have studied that are beyond 60 years of age and females will have one, sometimes two calves every three years. And they use many different habitats. Uh, beluga whales will use sea ice habitat, uh, estuarine habitat, coastal habitat, which is important for monitoring a complex ecosystem such as the Beaufort. Now, specifically, the Beaufort Sea beluga population is one of Canada's largest, with an estimated 40,000 individuals. Uh, the beluga whales spend their summer in the Canadian Beaufort Sea, so the whales arrive uh, went around uh, late May, early June. Uh, the females give birth to calves around early July in the warmer waters of the Mackenzie River estuary. The whales spend their summer feeding in the Amundsen Gulf before returning to their winter habitat uh, in the Bering Sea. Uh, Beaufort Sea beluga whales have a strong habitat association with sea ice, so males and females are sexually dimorphic. The males are significantly larger, and large males tend to select offshore pack ice, whereas females with young calves I tend to select more open water habitat near the mainland. Uh, they're prolific divers, uh, so they can dive uh, between four, four to 900 meters, sometimes over a thousand meters, and it tends to be the large males that make these dives that are believed to be for foraging purposes. And importantly, they are an important traditional food to communities across the Arctic. Now recently, uh, there was a 20 year decline in inferred growth rates within the Beaufort Sea Beluga population. So from about 1988 to 2008, uh, Beluga whales were getting smaller with age. Now one of the questions I had for my PhD was, could this impact diving ability? Because in tooth whales, the bigger you are, the deeper you dive. So why is bigger better in terms of diving? 
Well, it all has to do with how oxygen stores scale with body size in elite diving mammals. So if you're an elite diving mammal, you'll have very large blood volumes. You'll have uh, large, large, large blood volumes, and you'll also have high concentrations of an oxygen transport protein known as hemoglobin. Uh, next, you'll have a large muscle mass, and you'll also have high concentrations of an oxygen uh, storage protein known as myoglobin. And lastly, unlike us, you'll have very small lungs. Uh, so um, having large lungs is a bit of a liability if you're diving over a thousand meters, you might get the, the, suffer from the bends or decompression sickness. So elite diving mammals will have small lungs uh, relative to their body mass and will actually collapse their lungs upon descent. Uh, now, if you know the concentration of oxygen in these three tissues, and their relative volume, you can estimate the total body oxygen stores within a marine mammal. Now, if you divide it by the metabolic rate, which you can estimate through allometric equations based on body mass, you can estimate the aerobic dive limit or the theoretical time a marine mammal can dive with oxygen. So the overall objective of this part of my research was to examine, uh, to basically to get baseline information on the dive physiology of the whales, uh, examine the relationships between body condition and body mass to see whether declines in body size could impact foraging. Now, a secondary objective of my research was to examine the role of the spleen in beluga whales. Now, an elite diving seals uh, will have very large spleens relative to their body size. And it's believed that the spleen will act as a blood storage reservoir. So when these seals dive, they will contract their spleen and increase their blood volume. Uh, the spleen, spleen has been less studied in, in whales, cetaceans. So I sought to see whether it could play a role in diving in belugas. Now, my research was part of a community-based monitoring program and took place in the New Yellet settlement region. And I did all my work on uh, Kendall Island just off the coast of Taktiaktuk. Um, but I worked in partnership with several camps uh, in, uh, on Hendrickson Island, uh, Browns Harbor near Polytech, as well as East Whitefish. East Whitefish. Now, my research was part of a community-based monitoring program uh, in partnership with New Yellet communities across uh, the Northwest Territories. And this program has been running for about 30 years and is co-managed by the Fisheries and Joint Management Committee as well as Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, beluga meat is an important traditional food to communities across the North. It, ha it has been for many years. And so every year there is a hunt in which a small number of whales is taken from the population. And this hunt has been found to have no impacts on the demographics of the whales. So the whale population is currently stable and healthy. Uh, beluga meat is extremely nutritious. It's very high in vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin, vitamin E, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. And there have been many studies that have shown that uh, country foods, foods such as beluga muktuk, are much more nutritious than store-bought foods, which are often expired by the time they reach the north and extremely expensive. Uh, so this is a joint partnership uh, with communities in the north. Um, the communities are very concerned with the welfare of their whales and the impacts of climate change. Uh, there's a lot of co-production of knowledge. Uh, for example, um, that decline in inferred growth rates that I showed, uh, before that was even uh, published, uh, communities had actually been telling scientists that the whales were getting smaller. And finally, if it wasn't for this partnership, uh, we wouldn't know as much about the Beaufort Sea Beluga po population as we do today, and I would not have had any samples for my thesis. Emily, I don't mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your slideshow. Um, I think you're stuck in, um, on a slide in your view. So maybe if you could resume the slideshow through PowerPoint. Sure, here, I'll just stop share and then try it again. Can you see it? Is it fine? No, I think it's sharing another one of your screen. You have multiple screens right now. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll try it again. That's weird. Um, put it on. I'll, I'll close the other screens. Um, Is 
Is it the right screen or is it another? It's the same. Oh no. Um, Here, I'll see if I can close things. I do have, um, this is kind of weird. It's, this hasn't happened before. What screen are you seeing? It's just out of curiosity. The PowerPoint, so we can see the slides on the left and like the editing mode, basically. Oh, okay. I'll see if I can. You are sharing screen. Okay, stop share. Hmm. Two years into Zoom meetings, and we still. <laughs> <laughs> seem to be working these kinks out. It's still in editing mode? Yeah. Yes. Here, I'll, I'll try the other screen. There's, there's a, there's, narrowed it down to a few more, like a couple screens to share. So well, I'll try this. When I want to share my screen, I had to share through an application, not my desktop. There we go. Okay, that was weird. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Sorry about that. No problem. So I just thought I would show you some pictures of the Northwest Territories. I don't know how many of you have been to the Arctic. Uh, in so in order to get to my, my camp, I basically uh, took a plane uh, from Winnipeg to Inuvik, and then it was a four to six hour boat ride uh, up the Mackenzie River. So here are some pictures from my boat ride. Uh, so you can see uh, there's a lot of these are this is a pair of Arctic terns. Uh, they nested on the basically on the, the coasts of the Mackenzie Delta and they would often dive palm the researchers upon our approach. Uh, this is a stilted sandpiper. So on Kendall Island, uh, there is a very large uh, migratory bird sanctuary. Uh, this is a pair of, of, a, of um, sandhill cranes, uh, an Arctic loon. Uh, nest. And this is my camp. So this is the camp of the Rogers family on Kendall. So just to give you a sense of how this partnership works um, on each of the- Sorry. Uh, Emily, I can't hear you. I, can you hear me now? Uh, we, yeah, I, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, at each of the camps, there is a beluga monitor, and it's the role of the beluga monitor to be, basically keep track of the numbers of whales harvested, um, take a subset of samples for, for contaminant analysis, and to basically take measurements. And so the research team that I was a part of would work with the beluga monitor. And so what would happen is when a hunter lands a whale, uh, they would radio the beluga monitor, who would then accompany, um, who would then meet the hunter at their campsite. And while I was on uh, Kendall Island, there were several islands within the area. And so basically once the hunter uh, would haul in the whale and this would take anywhere from 30 minutes to several hours because they would have to move slowly with the boats. Um, so they would bring the whale to shore and then the community members would come together and basically haul the whale out of the, out of the water. And as you can see, this is a remote location. So this is basically done with uh, rope and human strength. And these whales are heavy. They can weigh over a ton. And um, once the whale is brought onto shore, then the monitor will take measurements of the whale. So this is me and uh, Blue Monitor John Day measuring the length. Uh, the monitor will also measure the girth, uh, sex of the whale, the flipper size. And then once um, the monitor has completed their measurements, then the families of the hunters will start to cut up the whales for their food. And it's usually at this point that I will ask permission to take a tissue sample from my research. Uh, as you can see, there's nothing but families on these islands. So usually a family takes no more than one whale uh, that'll last them throughout the year. Uh, this is a picture as part of the program. We also have many uh, local youth involved. So this is uh, Kendra who was in charge of the blood work on Kendall. And uh, so the community members are mostly, uh, they consume the blubber or muktuk. So this is, uh, they'll cut the blubber into strips and hang it out to dry. So this is uh, blubber or muktuk being dried. And they'll also consume the mussel or nitku, which is dry meat. And so when I live with the communities, I eat a lot of traditional foods with them as well. 
Now, um, as part of the program, so during the, the winter, um, when I'm not at the Beluga camps, I was often in the community uh, communicating my research to local schools as well as organizations. And as part of the program, or while we were at uh, the camps, again, not a lot of whales are harvested and when it rains, it pours. So I got a lot of time to basically take part in activities with the families. Uh, and so this is a picture of me learning how to bead, which is an important cultural activity in the North. Uh, this is a game of us playing snurf based on where you're trying to get rid of all your cards as fast as possible. And, and again, when we're at these camps, uh, there's no electricity, there's no Wi-Fi. So we played a lot of card games to stay entertained. And this is a game of baseball. And this was a real treat. So once in a while, the families would radio each other and we would play a game of baseball on one of the islands. And while this looks like it's taking place in the middle of the afternoon, uh, these games would tend to start around 11 p.m. at night and continue till about two in the morning. So uh, on Kendall Island, we are above the Arctic Circle. So we do experience 24 hours of daylight. But it's thanks to this wonderful partnership that I was able to collect almost 200 tissue samples from my work on beluga diet, which I will be sharing today, and almost 80 samples from my work on beluga diving physiology. So I was able to measure the following physiological parameters in 77 whales. So blood hemoglobin and hematocrit. A uh, hematocrit is a measure of uh, blood cells in a given volume. Uh, myoglobin globin and buffering capacity in the legitimus dorsi muscle. So legitimus dorsi is the main diving muscle of beluga whales. It runs along the back. And buffering capacity is a measure of how well the muscle functions uh, under anaerobic conditions. And finally, contracted spleen mass. And then I examine the, the relationship of these parameters with body mass, condition, age, and sex using linear models. And then I estimated the total body oxygen stores of the individual whales, as well as their dive limits. Uh, in terms of condition indices, I used two. One was a body, body condition index based on the residuals of a model fitted to maximum half girth. And this had been used before in bowhead whales. And I found that this indice was, in comparison to others, uh, was most associated with um, uh, dietary tracers of belugas, as well as Arctic cod biomass, which is their uh, main prey. And I also used maximum half girth to length ratio. And this is a more common uh, condition indice used in mammals. Uh, what I found was, was that beluga whales have one of the highest myoglobin concentrations of all marine mammals. So 83.9 milligrams per grams, uh, corrected for impurities, 77.9, uh, but the first value tends to be what is reported. Uh, they have high hemoglobin concentrations and they have fairly high buffering capacity. So they're an endurance swimmer. And when I compare these values in the literature, I found that they are most similar uh, to the narwhal. Uh, which is no surprise because they're from, they're, they're, they're from the same family. Uh, in addition, I also sequenced the myoglobin gene of the narwhal and found that there was a 99% similarity in coding sequence. Um, but uh, not, Terry Williams has done a lot of work on narwhal and believes that because of their extreme physiology, so they can dive over a thousand meters, um, they're very slow endurance swimmers, um, they are high, highly specialized for so sea ice, but because they're so specialized to their environments, um, this may make them more vulnerable to rapid change. Uh, so we believe that um, beluga diving physiology is more similar to narwhals than previously anticipated, which may make them sensitive to rapid change. Now, in terms of my models, um, body condition and both indices modeled separately um, was the most significant predictor of blood oxygen stores. So uh, hematocrit was the best predictor, body condition was the best predictor of hematocrit. Uh, hemoglobin was, was best predicted by body condition, age, sex, and their interaction, but body condition was the most significant predictor. Uh, so overall, I found that whales with higher condition also had higher percent hematocrit, as well as hemoglobin concentrations. Uh, similarly, for myoglobin, I also found that body condition alone best predicted muscle myoglobin. So again, whales with higher condition uh, had higher concentrations of myoglobin. I found that buffering capacity was best fitted by the null model. Buffering capacity isn't an indicator of oxygen stores. 
and log spleen mass was best fitted by Asian mass, but the spleen only comprised about 0.02% of the total body mass of whales, and therefore we believe it does not play a role in diving because of its small size. Now, in terms of the total body oxygen stores, uh, we found that the mean total oxygen stores of whales was about 58.7 milliliters per kilogram, which is similar to other prolonged diving mammals, such as the short fin pilot whale. And we found that beluga whales stored most of their oxygen in their blood relative to their muscle and lungs. So they had a similar uh, profile uh, or oxygen distribution profile to other elite diving mammals. Now, when we compared males and females, we found that although they had a similar percent total oxygen store distribution, when we took into account the larger body mass of males, uh, we found that they, they had significantly larger uh, total oxygen stores than females, which may explain why uh, in terms of historical tag data, males have been found to dive to greater depths. So one of the questions we had was, because we found these significant relationships between body condition and blood and muscle oxygen stores, uh, could this impact total oxygen stores? Uh, so what we did was we estimated the total body oxygen stores for each individual whale, but in order to look at the impact of condition alone, uh, we controlled for body mass. So we assumed that all the whales were the same body mass in our calculations. Uh, in addition, we compared the total oxygen store of the whale with the highest and lowest body condition, uh, assuming they had the same body mass. What we found was, was that the beluga whale with the lowest condition had about 12% lower muscle oxygen stores, 27% uh, 20, lower bl blood oxygen stores, which equated to about a three minute difference in dive time in comparison to the whale with the highest condition. And again, these uh, calculations are very conservative because in reality, they don't share the same body mass. But based on these uh, relationships, uh, we believe the impact of body condition on muscle and blood oxygen stores are additive, which may affect diving ability. So how does this impact foraging ability? Well, it all has to do with the differences in habitat associations of fish in the Beaufort Sea. So there's different fish communities uh, between the near shore and offshore environment, but also with depth, uh, in particular with the main prey of blue whale, uh, Arctic cod. So Arctic cod are found at their greatest at the greatest biomass between 350 to 500 meters. But Arctic cod also display a very significant size depth gradients. So young of the year Arctic cod tend to be uh, in the uh, shallower depths, whereas the larger older Arctic cod tend to be near the bottom. So based on these relationships, uh, we believe that beluga whales with poor condition and lower oxygen stores may not be able to access the largest and greater, greatest biomass of cod. So in summary, Arctic belugas are specialized for prolonged diving and navigating under sea ice. Declines in condition may affect oxygen stores and belugas. Therefore, whales in better physical condition may perform better under stressful circumstances, such as evading predators and ice entrapments. And finally, uh, we believe this could be a vicious cycle in which declines in condition caused by changes in prey availability could impact the dive time of the whales, uh, which imp would impact their ability to capture their prey, which would further worsen their condition. And this, uh, this study was published in the Journal of Experimental Biology in 2019 and was recently featured in an infographic by uh, Pineapples and Whales. So in terms of acknowledgements, so I'd like to thank the AFO Cafe Organizing Committee for their invitation to give a presentation. I'd like to thank uh, the communities, uh, Hank and Sarah Rogers, who were my host family for three summers, the Beluga Monitors, as well as the research team. Um, and community members, uh, Fisheries and Joint Management Committee and hunt the Hunters and Trapper Committees of Inuvik, Taktiaktuk, and Politik for their support, uh, as well as my supervisors and co-authors. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, <laughs> thanks, that was great. Um, so for uh, the rest of you <laughs> there, uh, if you want, you can turn on your cameras. Uh, this is supposed to be an informal conversation, 
Uh, so we, you can um, raise your hand if you have questions. And if uh, we have people on YouTube, uh, we are, you can also post questions on the chat box there and we can read those questions here so that Kendra and Emily can answer. And I will start <laughs> with a short question. I'm just wondering, and it could be, um, I think it's for both of you. Are the communities involved in other uh, monitoring programs, not just beluga whales, but other wildlife or environment, uh, environmental programs as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, the communities are very much involved. Um, through the, there is a new division through the Innovara Regional Corporation. So we do have the Innovation Science and Climate Change Division, um, which is the research division. So they do a lot of activities through that. There's also we also have the Joint Secretariat, which is the wildlife portion of of the Innovaluit um, co-management boards. Um, so so through the Joint Secretariat, they have a fisheries joint management committee. So they also have long-term fish, fishing monitoring um, research programs um, through through the various communities. For it. So one community like a Klavik, they have, um, they might uh, look at trout and white fish, but in Polytuck, they look at char, right? So, so there's different different um, species. Um, and then there was also the Inuvalawit harvest study. So through that harvest study, um, they tried to keep monitoring activities for all harvests of all animals within the Inuvalawit settlement region. Um, uh, that is also through the Joint Secretariat. Uh, so the, in, the IRC has um, an Inuvalawit indicators program, right? So through through that, they, they, uh, it's kind of with, with in collaboration with Statistics Canada, um, they'll, they'll collect uh, demographic information about the six communities up there. Uh, so there are various research activities. Um, it just takes a bit of sleuthing maybe to find which one you're looking for. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, where I am now. Um, so, I mean, I'm currently working on Coates Island uh, in Northern Hudson, but I know that in that region, there is like a really big one is the Arctic Eider Society. So that uh, if you've watched, there's a really great documentary, I'll just put it in the chat, uh, People of the Feather, that I highly recommend um, with, in collaboration with communities in Santa Cuba, Santa Kiliac, uh, People of the Feather. Um, there we go. I, I highly recommend that. And I know that um, the Environment Canada, I'm co-supervised at, uh, I believe that there are other collaborations with seabirds uh, as well. Um, there's SICU too, I'll type that in, which is a big um, monitoring program using an app um, with hunters that I guess collects information on environmental variables and wildlife. So that's another huge one going on. <laughs> Yeah, I also wanted to mention that there's the Arctic Net, right? So Arctic Net has a lot of um, monitoring activities um, throughout Inuit Nunungat. So there might be something that's happening in Nunavut that that overlaps with something happening in the ISR. There might be something happening in Nunatsiavut that overlaps with something in the ISR. So there's definitely um, pan regional, right? So where where there's Inuit. Um, ITK, so through Inuit Tapasit Kanitami, there's programs through there. Um, the Northern Contaminants Program has has a lot of long-term monitoring programs up in the NWT, so not just Inu, Inuit specifically focused. We might have um, overlap through Inuvik and Fort Smith, for example, right? So, so there's definitely um, a lot of programming that's happening. Um, and then just recently, the ITK issued um, some research program funding, right? That for Inuit-driven, self-determined research. Um, so, so there's a lot of potential for future monitoring programs as well that that are um, designed directly by Inuit, right? So that's that's interesting and exciting. Yeah, that's 
I've got a couple of questions here in the chat that came directly to me, but um, I'll just read them off. So Yvonne had asked, said, sorry if you mentioned this, but is there a way to age each whale you have a sample for? Emily? I, I don't know. So I don't know where you're reading. Uh, no, they came directly to me. Like they, there's oh, a way okay. in the chat where you can direct message people. So this message came to me. It says, sorry if you mentioned this, but is there a way to age each whale you have a sample for? So that's and I'll just ask that to Emily. Sorry, I couldn't hear. So like, how do you age? Is there, is there a way to age every whale that you have a sample for? Um, usually, how it, during my project, we age them using the molars uh, and counting the uh, rings. So that was, that was one way. And I believe that they just developed a new method of aging them using the weight of the eyelids, which is kind of new. But uh, yeah, yeah, with the teeth, that's how they, they age them. Nice. Uh, second question. Are only male burgers allowed to be taken for food? And are the oldest, largest animals most desirable? So this is the naive question. I guess I can answer that and, and say no. Um, we don't know whether we're getting a male or female until we land them after the fact. Um, you can tell, I guess, as soon as it's harnessed to your boat, but you can't tell when you're hunting them usually whether it's a male or female, unless they have a young with them, you know? So that's how you would identify, okay, that's a mother, let's kind of leave her alone. Um, so I would say that yes, though, they do go for the most oldest and largest animals, most desirable, because there, there is um, when the beluga monitor that Emily had mentioned that we partner with, um, they do take the measurements, right? So it, it is kind of like a, a, a radio competition to me, like my role was 16-8, right? <laughs> or, or something like that. So it is, it's not necessarily aimed for, but it is, it is, um, it's a good thing to get a bigger whale. Yeah, definitely. And that's... Those are the only two questions. Okay. Uh, so I had a, a previous question that you answered, I think, uh, before, but I'll just read it also for the people that are on YouTube. Is there a resource for etiquette to try to ensure that you do not inadvertently offend uh, due to cultural differences? And I think you posted, Kendra, do you want to answer that? But you posted a few links there. Yeah, absolutely. So the Aurora College um, has an Aurora Research Institute um, within the Western Arctic region. So they are situated in Inuvik and they developed a guidebook for doing research um, in the Northwest Territories. Um, and then there's also through ITK, they have a booklet for um, negotiating relationships with Inuit communities. And then lastly, um, the TCPS2 is, is a really great resource, especially chapter nine, so doing research with Inuit. Um, and just, just being able to like, go through those, and, and they do have checklists, right? So did you initiate contact with the communities? Did you ask them for their, their, their priority list, right? Like, um, do you have the resources available if they have a, another question to add on to your research, right? So do, is it, is your research viable? Basically, a lot of those guidelines are asking. Um, so, so yeah, um, and definitely the I had mentioned ITK. Um, they're a great resource. Um, if you just check out their their website, ArcticNet, um, and then IFC, the Nobel Regional Corporation, um, is is the uh, ADR um administration administrative hub so if there's ever any questions their website has a lot of good information they have a good staff directory on there as well um, and then I guess I can provide my information too um, I did um, a lot of logistical planning a lot of community tours throughout um, the ISR and then oh, we stopped hearing you Kendra 
Okay. Can, uh, we can't hear you. Okay. Better? Uh, yeah. It, no, it told me my internet was unstable again. So it's just, just one of those days, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I'll leave my contact information for anybody that might need it. I do, I do um, appreciate being being asked for 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 help, um, and I'm here to help definitely. Thank you, um, Matt. Are there questions? Yeah. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. I, I just wanted to add for everybody and for the YouTube recording that we can make these uh, links to resources available on our website along with the recording. And I'll be sure to put it in the YouTube description as well so that we can share all this information that you're um, suggesting uh, for everyone. Uh, oh, thanks. There's, that's your email there. Uh, do we have any other questions? I had a question. Um, yeah. So I apologize. I had to step out briefly. We had an issue in the building. So if you discuss this, I'm, I'm sorry to ask it. Um, so with, you know, ice free periods increasing and the amount of space that's open, you know, there's going to be more uh, ship traffic and more militarization of the Arctic. And I'm just kind of wondering whether you're seeing any of that now, whether you anticipate any effects on your communities and on natural resources as we see governments paying a lot more attention to militarizing the area. That is a really great loaded question. <laughs> um, so yeah, th there's definitely um, some, some projects in the works. Um, so we've got a marine program coordinator. So I keep talking like I'm still working for IRC. Um, so through <laughs> the IRC, they and the Innovation Science and Climate Change Division, there is a marine program coordinator. So she was tasked most recently to develop a, um, a kind of a reference document, a, a cruise ship management type of reference document for, for those types of activities, right? So um, there are definitely cruise vessels that um, dock within the waters of Ulukaktuk. Right. So, so this that document is, is very much important. Um, I can't say how far along it is now because I am no longer with IRC. Um, but there is definitely some types of um, communications and collaborations going on with all of the communities to determine how best they would like to. Um, manage and maintain their waters, um, especially in terms of, of free, the free passageway and and more people coming up um, to study, not not necessarily just study um, the waters, but also being able to to see how farther how much further down they can they can get, right? So um, so those types of talks are in the works. I unfortunately am not not a part of IRC right now because I am at the University of Lethbridge and took some leave, but um, definitely reach out to IRC if, if you have uh, any deeper questions like that. So um, Jennifer Pellet, she is the Director of Innovation Science and Climate Change there, um, and she has um, a ton of resources that, that she, can, she can share with you for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to both of you. That was super fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so, Emily, I know we're going to hear you talk at the October, <laughs> during our October meeting, uh, but I was just wondering if uh, your approach um, in studying the thick built mirrors is similar to what you've been doing uh, with the beluga whales. Well, um, unfortunately, um, yeah, it's less, there's less community involvement, unfortunately, with the MERS. I mean, I guess part of the issue is where we are on Coates Island, there isn't a local, like a community close by. And so there are, um, right now we do have, um, there are uh, Inuit members involved um, in terms of uh, collecting, collect, uh, having to the band the birds and um, with bear guard, but there isn't as much involvement uh, with the communities uh there are the research is related to the community 
um, during the, the winter. I guess another major issue with um, the work in the, um, and uh, Coates is that Coral Harbor, so the closest community is Coral Harbor. And for the past two years, um, the research team has tried to get to the community to um, communicate our results. But every year for the, before, even before COVID, um, the past two trips were canceled due to the weather. So it's much more difficult uh, finding to get to than uh, when I went to Anubik. Um, so no, um, unfortunately, um, yeah, there, I, I, the Blue Cook program had a lot more um, community involvement and uh, production of uh, joint, um, the questions were also um, created by uh, communities as well. And what was actually the impact of COVID in those areas? Maybe uh, Kendra or Emily will know, because I'm just wondering if um, that affected I don't know, harvesting or uh, their lives in general, yeah. COVID um, definitely put a, a spotlight, I think, um, is the perfect word for, for our area. Um, and and it was it was those long lasting relationships and those long term monitoring programs that 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 continued because of the relationships with the communities and and being able to train locals to do the work before COVID even hit, right? Everybody was involved, everybody was hands-on. We understood our assignments, right? Um uh, I guess one story I can I can give is when when an elder had first landed the whale, remember the similar one, we, we, we were piggybacking with the, um, the blog monitoring team and two boats pulled up and our research team jumped off the boat and she's like, whoa, 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 what, how, who are all you people? Why are you all here? I only want the blog to monitor here. Um, and she kind of asked us to back off the whale, right? She, she was like, no, I, there's too many people here. Um, we just need measurements, that's all. And, and I sat down and I talked with her and I let her know that we're here because we want to understand the entire house of the beluga whale. We're not here to, to butcher or sabotage or or take advantage of, of their harvest. Um, we'll sit back and you can tell us what to do and tell us what pieces of the whale we're allowed to take, but we're not here to harm anything and she said no no that's fine um so at first of all we kind of didn't get um uh, the blood samples that I needed so I was the, the blood lady there um, and so the second world though she was like okay yeah she got it kind of let us get at it and, and was a little bit more comfortable with our team but by the third world she sat back she let us <laughs> she let us get on with it she helped her family butcher and kill because that's one of the biggest things is you're helping the family butcher their harvest right you're not there to take your samples immediately you're kind of there to help first and then take your Samples later. Um, so I think with um, COVID coming up, because the monitoring programs um, were, were more hands on, they, they were able to continue because we were zoo meetings to. To, to provide additional training as needed. Um, a lot of the sample kits were prepared um, in, in South, right? They might have been prepared in Winnipeg, they might have been prepared in Ottawa, um, and then they were shipped north, right? So we know that it wasn't um, necessarily that big of a change um, for those long-term programs, but the smaller programs that were just getting started, you know, they didn't really have their foot out of the ground, um, they, didn't really, they didn't have those strong relationships. Um, a lot of the techniques needed the researchers and the scientists up there to, to work their equipment, um, and so, so they kind of um, didn't get as well samples as, as they could have um, in the first year. Um, and then they worked off of that, right? How do we build off of those? How do we make it better? Can we provide additional Zoom training? Like what, what types of steps do we need to take in case we can't come up again next year? And then they weren't allowed again to come up, right? So they prepared themselves. So um, 
I guess researchers taking the, the responsibility for their research, even though they're not on the ground, was, was really helpful. Like being, okay, so I understand that we need to get this started off the ground in May, so I'm going to contact them in February. And, and we're going to work this out throughout the next couple of months and it's going to start off in May just as it's supposed to, you know, as opposed to getting a hold of them on April 20th being like, this is closing out the door and tell those why haven't you started? Well, yeah. that's, that's them, you know, like we can't start without you. Um, so, so definitely um, having the researcher be passionate, be passionate about their work and wanting it to succeed within the community has definitely has helped a lot of um, restrictions. Um, so, yeah, I guess that, that's the biggest thing is just making sure that you build those strong partnerships and have those lines of communications open always um, because it, it definitely helps, um, helps for success. Yeah, I'll just jump in that like my COVID silent research, like we haven't returned since 2019 because of COVID and we're not even sure if we're going to go up this year because we're a big threat, obviously, to communities who don't have, obviously, the infrastructure, hospitals that we have in the, the South. Um, so and the only programs that I know that have continued have been the ones that have, that are community-based, that have people, that have partnerships with communities in the North who are doing collections um, for um, in partnership with universities and uh, institutes in the south, so those are the only ones that I know that have continued. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we have any more questions, uh, but I want to thank you both. This was really interesting. Uh, thank you for taking your time to present at the AFO Cafe, and. Um, Hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you all.